In the late 1930s, every major air force in the world fell in love with a myth. It was the myth of the heavy fighter, the Zerstörer, or destroyer. The theory was seductive. A twin-engine beast with the range of a bomber and the firepower of a battleship, capable of sweeping the skies clear for the invasion forces. Two nations took this concept to the extreme. The United States built the P-38 Lightning, a radical twin-boom design that became the backbone of the Pacific and a terror in Europe. Nazi Germany, desperate to replace their aging BF-110, built the Messerschmitt Mi-210. One became a legend that shot down Admiral Yamamoto and swept the skies of Normandy. The other became a scandal so catastrophic it nearly destroyed the reputation of Willy Messerschmitt and cost the Luftwaffe thousands of lives, mostly from accidents. Today, we are conducting a forensic audit of these two heavyweights. We aren't just looking at top speed. We are looking at the engineering culture that created a war winner and the arrogance that created a death trap. To understand why one failed and one succeeded, we have to look at the drawing board. In 1937, the U.S. Army Air Corps wanted a high-altitude interceptor. Lockheed's Kelly Johnson gave them a radical solution. To carry the massive armament and fuel required, he didn't just put engines on wings, he built the plane around the engines. Critical detail. The P-38 was designed with General Electric turbo superchargers buried in those long booms. Citation. According to Lockheed Archives, this allowed the Allison Vive 1710 engines to maintain full power above 25,000 feet. While German fighters were gasping for air in the thin atmosphere, the P-38 was just getting started. It was quiet, fast, and high. Now, look at the German approach. The RLM, Reich Air Ministry, wanted a successor to the BF-110. Willy Messerschmitt, fresh off the success of the BF-109, was overconfident. He designed the Mi-210 to be a jack-of-all-trades, dive bomber, interceptor, reconnaissance. But he made a fatal aerodynamic error. To reduce drag, he shortened the fuselage significantly. Citation, technical reports from the Recklin Test Center indicate the Mi-210 suffered from severe longitudinal instability. Imagine throwing a dart that has no feathers. That was the Mi-210. The center of gravity and the center of lift were dangerously close. If a pilot pulled up, the aircraft didn't just climb, it wanted to flip. Test pilots reported a phenomenon called snaking. The plane would oscillate left and right, making it impossible to aim. And if you pulled too tight in a turn, the airflow over the wings separated, the automatic slats popped open unevenly, and the plane snapped into a vicious flat spin. The Germans tried to solve their defense problems with sci-fi technology. The Mi-210 featured the FDSL-131, remote-controlled gun turrets aiming rearward, controlled by the gunner using a pistol grip sight. It was a marvel of engineering and a tactical failure. Citation. Post-war British evaluations of captured Mi 210s noted the system was complex, heavy, and difficult to aim during high-G maneuvers. While the gunner was trying to play a video game with a periscope, a Spitfire was already chewing off his tail. The P-38? It relied on brute force, 4.50 caliber machine guns and one 20 millimeter cannon, all mounted in the nose. Because they weren't on the wings, there was no convergence point. You didn't have to calculate distance. If the sight was on the target, the bullets hit the target. From 50 yards to 1,000 yards, the P-38 created a cone of death that pilots called the buzz saw. This highlights the core difference. The P-38 was complex where it mattered, engines, but simple where it counted, guns. The Mi-210 was complex everywhere, 
making it a maintenance nightmare on the frozen Russian front or the dusty airfields of Tunisia. Both aircraft faced the laws of physics, but they reacted differently. The P-38 was so aerodynamically clean that it hit speeds no one had encountered before. In a dive, it hit compressibility. Mach 0.68. The air piled up on the wings, locking the controls. But here is the American adaptability. Lockheed didn't scrap the plane. They researched. They added dive flaps, small metal strips that deployed under the wing to restore lift distribution. Citation. Introduced on the P-38J-25 block in 1944. This simple fix allowed P-38 pilots to dive away from Fokker Wolfs, recover, and zoom climb back into the fight. The Mi-210, however, couldn't be fixed with a flap. The airframe itself was broken. On September 5, 1940, the second prototype, Mi-210V2, broke up in mid-air during dive tests. The pilot escaped. The plane disintegrated. Despite this, the RLM, under pressure from Hermann Göring, ordered 1,000 of them. It was the sunk cost fallacy in action. They had spent so much money, they refused to admit it was a lemon. So, did they fight? Yes. The Luftwaffe deployed the Mi-210 with Unit 3-ZG-1, the WASP wing, to Tunisia in late 1942. They were supposed to stop the Allied landings. It was a massacre. Citation, diaries from 3rd ZG-1 pilots reveal they feared the landing more than the enemy. Against the P-38 lightnings of the 1st and 82nd fighter groups, the Mi-210 was helpless. It couldn't turn with the P-38, and it couldn't outclimb it. British reports from the 13th of November 1942 state that Mi-200s and 10s were jettisoning their bomb loads and fleeing at the mere sight of Allied fighters. Meanwhile, the P-38 was proving to be the most versatile plane of the war. In the Pacific, it was the only fighter with the range to intercept Admiral Yamamoto. In Europe, it became the Jabo fighter bomber that paralyzed German rail lines. The Mi-210 was eventually pulled from the front line, not by the enemy, but by the Germans themselves. General Erhard Milch, responsible for aircraft production, finally had enough. He called the Mi-210 a disease and halted production in April 1942. It was a decision that likely saved the Luftwaffe from total collapse, but the damage was done. Valuable resources, aluminum, engines, pilots, had been wasted for two critical years. Messerschmitt did eventually fix it. They lengthened the fuselage, added leading-edge slats, and put in bigger engines. They called it the Mi-410 Hornis. It was actually a good airplane, fast and heavily armed, but it appeared in 1943. By then, thousands of P-38Js and P-47s were flooding the skies. It was too little, too late. So, what is the verdict? The P-38 Lightning proves that a complex design can win if you have the industrial capacity to perfect it and the humility to fix problems like the dive flaps. The Mi-210 is a lesson in hubris. It proves that no amount of advanced technology, remote turrets, can fix a bad airframe. The Mi-210 wasn't just a bad plane, it was a strategic disaster. Every Mi-210 built was a Fokker Wolf 190 that wasn't built. And that, more than anything, is why the destroyer helped destroy the Luftwaffe. If you enjoyed this deep dive into aviation engineering disasters, make sure to like and subscribe. This is MicroDocs. Thanks for watching.